Thank you. Is my mic on? I guess it's on. Um, my name is David Shimko. I'm representing uh, NYU uh, Tandon School of Engineering. And the topic today for me will be simpler option pricing. I'm really happy to see that uh, this is one of Peter Carr's passions was simplifying uh, options. And we, we have a number of talks at this conference about changing time scales and changing distributions. And what I'm going to do today is actually change our own time and travel back into time and look at the original foundations of the financial models of the CAPM and see if we can actually derive um, option prices. And there's some pretty surprising results. But before I continue, <laughs> I have to thank Peter Carr, and every time I raise here to my eye to mention his name, but you know, here um, when we met, I was uh, I was a professor at um, at uh, USC. It was my first uh, first year there in 1987. Uh, he was a graduate student at UCLA, and this is a picture from uh, from Maggie Copeland's uh, 30th birthday party <laughs> from that time. And here's Peter on the left, of course, and and myself with hair on the on the right. Uh, and Maggie's still teaching with us now as an adjunct professor. So we, we're, you know, we feel like a big family, I think, the, the Peter Carr community. Um, so, you know, Peter invited me to come to come teach here because we had a, a corporate finance class, which was mostly like an MBA class. And uh, he felt that it should be something more suited to financial engineering. I said, it'd be a really good idea to create instead of a, an MBA corporate finance class, why don't we do a class on valuation that talks about how to apply valuation themes across many different types of assets and, and derivative classes and integrate all those things together, right? And so I thought, well, this is a fun challenge. And it took a few years to get the slides together and get the curriculum done. Um, but the hardest part was getting all these students, you know, pretty fresh, really. Some had experience, of course, but some coming to this, you know, the, for the first time, right, after their undergraduate career. And we're asking them to understand options in a general kind of valuation setting. And how do you do that? How do you take someone and teach them stochastic calculus, teach them how to apply differential equations, which they might have passed one undergraduate course in, right? It's a, what an impossible task that was. Now, we know that Black, Scholes, and Merton knew the answer before they derived the differential equation. So that was the easiest way to solve that particular one. But if you were to try to do that from scratch, that would be an impossible task for an undergraduate. So we developed this class so we could, we could teach these new students, these master students, many represented here. I'm getting a couple of nods over, over here. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so I said, well, why don't, why don't we try to figure out a way to teach option pricing derivations to these, these folks? They're smart. They're brilliant analytical people. They just don't know stochastic calculus, and, and, and they aren't solving difficult differential equations. So let's do something that we can solve with college-level calculus. And I, I thought I had made a mistake because I, you know, I was going through the Cap M and I had the Cap M chapter, and then there was the, the derivatives chapter. How do we how do we go to that? And I said to Peter one day, I think I think I found it. I think I found a way that you can go directly from teaching someone the Cap M to teaching derivatives pricing. He didn't believe me. You don't believe me. I hope. I hope because my job today is to before lunch to convince you that this is true. Right? Um, so Peter said, prove it to me. And like anyone who comes to Peter's office, you're going to right, right away be handed a, 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 a felt pen and get over to the whiteboard and you're going to have to explain it to him. He's going to explain to you where it's wrong and, and, and have a discussion. And I went through the whole thing and he just, he just asked me to stop. Just, you know, not say anything, just stop, just stop talking. After about half a minute, he started laughing. I said, how, how could this be so easy? How do we miss this? It turns out what I'm going to teach you today is the easiest thing. Nothing complicated, no martingales, no integrals, no stochastic calculus. Anyway, the proof uh, was unerased for several, for several weeks afterwards. And he encouraged me, he said, you know, we got, we got to get this published. And he really helped out on the last day when I want him to check my proof. Unfortunately, he never responded to that email. It appeared um, a few days ago, actually, in the Journal of Derivatives. So you can, you can find it. It has been published. OK. So this is the last equation you'll see of this type. Um, the review of the traditional teaching of option pricing is, is this. I remember a PhD student had to memorize this, right? The stochastic differential equation, Ito's lemma, um, uh, imposed this self-financing condition, which always seemed a little suspicious to me to have like derivative terms just drop out of the equation. 
but we'll come back to that, okay? Um, you choose a hedge ratio to eliminate your risk. The risk premium vanishes, imposing no arbitrage. You solve the PDE with the boundary conditions, and just like that, you have a option pricing solution for the European call or put. Easy, right? Okay. So how do you get from the cap M to derivatives? The one period cap M, right? No, no multi-period cap M, no continuous time cap M, which you know, obviously Fisher Black had done. He made that connection. So let's price that European call option. Let's get rid of all that advanced mathematics that are that's outside of reach of undergraduates. Use the market model or the cap M to, to price it. And it turns out that some academics had tried this. You know? So okay, let's try to apply the cap M to, to pricing options. And the problem is you got negative, you got you got negative option prices, you got non-convex option prices, which meant that butterfly strategies could have you know, negative value and positive payouts. So, so they gave up on the cap M as a way to price options. We obviously can't create uh, you know, free lunch for traders, right? Negative, negative option prices, that'd be great. They'd love that. With negative butterfly spreads, they could have a free dinner too, but we can't allow that. Uh, so we wanna see if we can uh, make some kind of adjustment to make this work. And it turns out it's not that hard. The reason these people had this problem is they took the cap M formulas and tried to apply them directly to the calculation of option prices. So you compute the equilibrium without options and then try to use the formula to calculate the value of the options. What I did is just added one step. Say, look, if you're gonna build an equilibrium model, it should be the case that every equilibrium model you build has a provision that says arbitrage is impossible. You didn't have to do that in the cap M because you have a full rank matrix of, of assets, right? You can't create arbitrage portfolios in that situation. So you don't worry about it. You don't need the constraint. But if you're going to introduce derivatives into a cap M, you need to say, well, whatever equilibrium I come to has to be solved under the idea that I've got to constrain the equilibrium so there's no arbitrage. Okay, so that's all we do. So when people say to me, is this an equilibrium model? Is it a arbitrage model? So what's the, why do you distinguish between the two? Because if you have arbitrage, you don't have equilibrium. Every equilibrium model should have a provision that prohibits arbitrage. Okay, so now I promised we travel back in time. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go back to 1965, 1966. A lot of us learned that Cap M was founded by four people, um, Trainer, Sharp, Lintner, and Mosin. And we assume, if you haven't read the papers carefully, that they were all saying pretty much the same thing. But it turns out they weren't. The popular Cap M that we looked at was, you know, uh, by Professor Sharp. It took the investor's point of view of the markets, designing your optimal portfolio based on knowledge of expected returns, standard deviations, and correlations. What Lintner and Mosin did was they took the issuer side, the corporate side. And so we're going to issue securities, which we have to sell in total to the marketplace. And the market is going to price them in such a way that, that the market clears. They both, they both lead to the same final equations for expected returns. But if you take the Linder mosin approach, um, you actually get this very nice result. Um, I'm going to do it for a very simple case of one asset. If there's one asset right in the economy, the issuer says, I've got to price this to, to clear the market. So we have a supply curve. They've got to sell 100%, n equals 1. Investor, the single investor in this case, or the representative investor, whatever you want to call them, uh, maximizes some objective function, right? And that uh, unconstrained investor is going to say, well, show me the price of this asset. I'm going to calculate the expected return um, and the risk adjustment, and I'm going to maximize my, well, they would have used utility at that time. But I can say it doesn't have to be utility. And by the way, I'm suspicious of utility functions altogether, and I might get, get, get kicked out of the profession for this. I don't know. But the reason I, you know, I don't like utility functions is because I don't know what mine is. You know, my mom and dad never told me what it was. And someone said I could have revealed preferences, but that just seemed way too personal. You know, I don't have any utility functions. But as someone who's worked on Wall Street, as well as, you know, in academics, I could say, well, I don't have to think of utility. I'm just gonna, I can think in simply in terms of risk adjusted value added. So when I optimize, I'm going to try to maximize my, uh, my return, my overall expected return with a risk adjustment. That's it. Now, it turns out when you do that, 
um, your formula will look familiar to you. If you're evaluating a cash flow in one period, this is the one period uh, valuation, uh, we have a, a, like a certain equivalent pricing. We take the mean of the cash flow, we subtract a, a risk charge, A times sigma squared, right? Sigma squared being the measure of variance. Hopefully Nassim Taleb isn't here because he would probably shoot me right now just for saying standard deviation. Um, but you take that sort of risk adjusted mean and then discounted the risk free rate by multiplying by the, you know, the discount bond. So you can see it's a, it's a familiar model, you know, to all of us, I think, who's, who studied finance, um, but we didn't always go back and look at these, these, these early versions. Here's the formula, it's quite simple. It's a quadratic form. It's an unconstrained maximization that the investors perform, and it leads to an asset price which clears the market so it makes the number of securities issued equal to one, 100%. Okay, two risky assets. And then we'll do three, four, and five. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. We'll stop at two, okay? So put in two assets instead of one. And let's call the second asset C. The first one we'll call S. And if you're, if you're with me, you're probably thinking ahead to what I'm going to do next. But let's, for now, just call the assets S and C. So they each have a mean, they have a variance, they have covariance, you know, the usual, the, the usual statistics, right? But we still have a market clearing condition. Market has to sell all the available securities, right? So both the end values are one. Unconstrained investors are going to maximize risk-adjusted value, value added. And what they get is this nice, beautiful elliptic paraboloid, right? And they say, uh, okay, based on this, uh, we're going to, the market, quote unquote, is going to set the prices of the two assets so that both of these markets clear for each asset. We maximize, of course, this is, you know, uniformly concave, you know, doesn't even depend on uh, N, N at all. Now we get a unique global maximum easily as long as it's unconstrained. And we get the two asset formula, which looks very much like the one asset case, but instead of making a, a risk adjustment, for just the variance of the asset, like in the single asset case. In this case, we take the covariance matrix. The first row of the covariance matrix is assigned to the first asset. And the second row of the covariance matrix is assigned to the second asset. Okay, so we measure variance, as you know, in the cap M as covariance relative to the market. But using the lindner mosin approach, we're using the, you know, we're using the dollarized version. We're not dealing in percentage terms. And this has the additional benefit that we don't start from the point of having expected returns given to us. We had derived them from the, from the value of the, of the assets in equilibrium. Something they didn't come up with though, which is really interesting, didn't appear in print. But if you do the two variable case, you can actually solve, right? They, you know, you look at this and as a, as a practitioner, you might say, well, I, I hate this A, I don't know what the risk aversion parameter is. Right, how am I going to, to make this useful to myself? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to price asset two relative to asset one or C relative to S. Okay, so I have the value of asset C is looks like uh, it's the value of asset S times some kind of beta um, plus the present value of this, this mean adjustment. Now, if you're like me, you look at that and say, that, that looks like a crude option pricing formula. Right? Couldn't this be like S times N of D1 plus the present value of, of some other thing? Looks like that roughly. Looks like Bachelier roughly. It's just a regression, right? It's a simple, simple, you know, single variable regression model. So that's, um, you know, that's not a problem. Um, but it gives us a relative valuation formula for C relative to S. So here's where you run into trouble. If you try to use this formula to price an option, things go badly for you. So what if C were an option, a, a call option on asset S? Then C becomes, in our language, a derivative. But the derivative exists in zero net supply. It's not like one unit like the other assets. It's going to be zero units in net. So all options have to be have a buyer and a seller. So N is equal to one, and NC is equal to zero in equilibrium. You put the formula together, right? It looks even just a little simpler. The beta is this, the standard regression beta, right? Covariance divided by variance. And you can call it the static hedge ratio. You could call this the beginning of uh, the weapons of financial mass destruction if you're Warren Buffett. 
and you try to um, figure out if this makes sense. Now, I know a lot of you know automatically what convexity is in options, but the th one of the things that has to make sense is there's no arbitrage, right? Because we have to have, we have, to have the ability um, to, to price on, uh, or not have any positive profits from things that don't cost us anything to get into. So this is, I think this is a background slide if you're not familiar. And, and uh, the bottom line here is that the second derivative of the call option price with respect to the strike has to be positive wherever there's any probability mass for the outcome of the, of the underlying. Okay, so let's say you apply this in, in the Bachelier case, which is the normal distribution for the, the underlying asset value. You calculate the expectations, um, you know, and you find the covariance, which is very easy. It's just an application of Stein's lemma. We get an option pricing formula that looks just like Bachelier, except for one thing. This D is a function of the natural mean. And this is what causes the problem, as you know, right? When you plot the option prices from this Bachelier model with that false application I just did, you will get call option prices, which are the blue dashed lines, which are negative sometimes. And sometimes they are concave. So that's why you know, option pricing failed. So what can, we, what can we do to fix this? You do this, by the way, you do this for a Bachelier model, you always can solve for this point X, see a critical strike price. And for the cause, it's always a positive price. And beyond that price, then that's exactly where it becomes concave. So the existence of XC is, is actually a way of describing right, this problem, is that XC exists. So, great. Go back to your undergraduate days in your sophomore year, you just took uh, some advanced economics class and you learned how to use the Lagrangian method to solve optimization with constraints. You say, why don't I just solve the cap M equilibrium? And constrain it so there's no arbitrage. I'll make that, I'll take that second derivative and make sure that's, that's positive. What I'm really doing is I'm kind of restricting the class of functions for the option price to be convex in, in the strike price. That's all. By making that limitation, I'm getting an option pricing formula, which is exactly the same as um, the Bachelier model. Okay, so uh, again, I'll, um, you know, you're happy to go over the, the math a little bit later, but this, this second derivative has to be strictly positive as long as we're assuming compact support, which of course, I'm, I'm making that assumption. So when you write down the Lagrangian conditions for the, the, the um, maximization, you can actually solve and you can show the second derivative has this term. And so therefore I can solve this when this is equal to zero, very easily, right? It's just simple, simple algebra. And I get an equation for that critical strike price, Xc. As you can see that that, that strike, critical strike price always exists, right? Except in one case. New, the natural mean discounted risk-free rate minus the value of the cash flow, that's asset one, that can't be zero. But what, what does it mean if that's zero? This says we need to find some way to make this impossible. And the only way to do that is to make that denominator equal to zero. That's of course risk neutral pricing. The only time when this is undefined, so it's gotta be equal to zero, at least it doesn't change the parameters, it's just in the option pricing formula that has to happen. So there it is, price of European option. You calculate the, uh, the, the present value, the expected cash flow at the risk-free rate, but substituting for the natural mean, the forward price of the underlying asset. And it's like a story where you knew the answer, right? You knew we were gonna get here. But this is a, a different way to get there, a different way to teach students how to, how to understand this. As a special bonus though, I thought it would be fun to just see, you know, when I got to the, the point, you know, when I was, instead of putting this constraint on and re-optimizing stuff, what if I instead, instead used the self-financing condition? Now in a continuous time model in, in Merton, you, it's very clear what that means. 
right? The hedge portfolio has no, no cash being thrown off of it. In the static model, it doesn't really mean anything. But in spite of not meaning anything, when you impose the self-financing condition, guess what happens? You get the result immediately. Because it turns out that mathematically in the static context, the self-financing condition is the same as requiring that the derivative of the option price with respect to the natural mean is equal to zero. So you're eliminating the mean from the equation. So some people say, well, this is really not any different than, than, than Black and Scholes, but, but I'm suggesting that this kind of suggests the idea that self-financing is what makes Black and Scholes Black and Scholes. You wouldn't get that result if you didn't make that assumption. So in some ways, this is a very, very simple result, but I believe it's, it's also stronger in some ways. Okay. I think I'm running out of time almost. So what's the value of this model? Of course, I started with a, with a pedagogical purpose. I want undergraduates or recent undergraduates graduated to learn option derivations. I wanna show um, how to link uh, no arbitrage ideas from the continuous time setting, but use them in the static setting. Those were all static ar arbitrage op um, possibilities we talked about. Back when I was on Wall Street, we talked about the convergence of asset pricing and derivative pricing. I think this is a, a contribution in that direction. I hope to see that, that, uh, that improve. Uh, it reconciles equilibrium and, and arbitrage models in a very broadly applicable way by forcing right, an, an equilibrium model to have a no arbitrage condition. Uh, shows the power of the self-financing condition and it fills a gap in the classical finance literature because now you can go right from the one period cap M to a one period option pricing model. Don't, you, don't use utility, you can just use risk adjusted value added. Solve for the equilibrium, right? With a no arbitrage constraint. So as for applications, um, I think one benefit of this is that it eliminates the need to specify stochastic processes. This is why I don't really have to worry formally about martingales and this, this kind of approach and, and so on. Um, I can broaden the applicability option pricing formulas. I was really delighted to see that Professor Jarrow was talking about illiquid assets, because I believe this is another way to do that. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do with this model is to uh, say, um, you know, some, of these, some of these problems, you know, like we always assume geometric Brownian motion. So it's the, I, I think even Professor Jarrow said that's the best model for stock. But if you think about it, zero is not accessible. Right? So a company can't really go bankrupt in the black shells model unless it jumps to zero in the Merton model, right? So what if you had a, you know, a, a, a kind of a compound option where, where firms optimally decide how to abandon their assets or optimally go bankrupt and default to their creditors and then get the process that comes from that for the purpose of applying options to small company stocks, you know, where, where bankruptcy is a real possibility. Another thing is that this, this also links the, uh, the idea of the portfolio management, right, from, uh, you know, from even before the, the CAPM uh, into uh, options analysis. And I'm hoping that we can find some ways to get richer uh, portfolio recommendations as a result of integrating the, the two theories at this, this foundational level. Okay, that's it. Uh, any questions from the uh, studio audience? Which slide? Oh, thank you. Uh, the I think it was the first or the second slide, the picture with Peter. Oh, the picture with Peter? Yeah, yeah. After all that, you want to see the picture with Peter? I poured my soul out to you. Um, okay. Uh, just one question. What does the Hebrew sentence mean? <laughs> ah, the Hebrew. Baruch uh, Dayan Ha'emetz. So it means uh, roughly, uh, you know, blessed to be the, the righteous judge. Well, thank you for that question. <laughs> Okay, Sebastian, uh, please wait for the microphone so the online people can hear your question.
Yeah. Th thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> I, it's more common than a question. Uh, there's something a little similar. It reminds me of a paper by Nassim and Emmanuel Derman, uh, The Illusions of Dynamic Replication, yep. that seems to be a little bit on the similar line of saying, well, we could have found you know, the Black Scholes formula as much earlier without any stochastic calculus by uh, requiring that uh, we have no arbitrage and therefore you know, the model should be consistent uh, with forward pricing and things like that. So I'm seeing a little bit of similarity in your approach. And I guess there was a controversy after that. Uh, well, there's something a little bit anachronic because um, you're kind of you know, uh, using posterior knowledge of no arbitrage or you know, how the options market work and so on. So I wonder if you gave any thought about the parallels with this paper and and um, yeah. and and differences with our approach. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent question. Um, so there's there's actually two papers. One you might not have heard of. Um, the first one was by Taleb and Derman, and what they did is they used the uh, option uh, the no arbitrage constraints to basically get all the coefficients right of the n and d one n and d two and so on, and to show that when it wasn't really necessary to to go through all this derivation by using the the no arbitrage constraints. You know, because of the limit, limiting values of the calls and the puts. Um, if you look at the paper, though, there was a, it was problematic uh, because they didn't really they asserted that the adjustment, the risk neutral adjustment made to those coefficients, also applied to the uh, arguments of the function, and that was a key part that was missing. And you also notice in the next issue of that journal that came out, there was a, a refutation uh, by two economists. I don't their names escape me, but they showed that uh, the the model was was inaccurate. So um, that, was, uh, that, was, that was my response for, for, for Taleb. The second one, Peter Carr wrote a paper on the subject and never published it. I don't think why he was so fascinated with this. So it was, it was also based on, on no arbitrage principles, but it well, suffered ultimately from the same problem as Nassim's paper. Uh, it, was not, it was not accepted for publication, so no one ever saw it. But you know, I think we could even make that available, I, I think now, is if people were interested in seeing it. Uh, actually, there's, there's. Uh, no, I'm here. Um, hey, there he is. Hi. No, no. Actually, the, 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 the paper. There's a, a, a continuation to the story is that I, I went back and about a few years later, but this has not been noticed. Showed that if you use the uh, Breeden Litzenberger thing, like the the put measure needs to be equal to the call measure by arbitrage. But then he said, okay, we invoke the argument, uh, the arbitrage argument as formulated by Keynes, 1923, where Keynes showed that the forward is not an expectation operator. A forward is a very simple arbitrage relationship based on available prices in the market. It's constructed by, um, by, by, so we said that if the forward is an arbitrage, uh, thing and then the other one is let's remember that before black trolls we had all these pricing formulae a lot of them that basically used the expectation operator but they were confused as to the 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 risk uh, you know free return or whatever what 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 mu to put in what what and without using probability measure or anything they, they, you know, what one immediately can see that the Keynes argument brings you to that. Okay. And that was one thing missing in our paper, just a footnote to change the whole story. And then later on, I used the Breeden Litzenberger by saying that the, uh, if you take a put and a call, okay, they, they have the same second derivative. So they have the same density uh, for you can construct the thing all, all across. So, in other words, instead of doing dynamic hedging where you go into the limit of delta T, you do you do a vertical uh, uh, thing. It's like sort of Riemann versus Borel, is you do a vertical thing where you go to the limit of delta k, where you have all these strikes, and effectively then you have a unique measure. So that was that was uh, that was uh, that was what we uh, the continuation of that paper. But nobody has people were interested in the beginning, but nobody was interested in the continuation. Well, that sounds very interesting. It also looks like you went a little bit in the time dimension there with your delta t. Right, in order to get the second condition, is that the right interpretation? No, there's there's two things that, that we actually we need to assert here. The first one, maybe I'll talk about it tomorrow. Now I'm getting ideas. The first one is that the mu for the underlying security 
okay, is not, uh, uh, doesn't enter the pricing formula. That's the first statement. And the second one is that the option will never become risk-free by dynamic hedging. So the option is not a risk-free item in and by itself. Unlike the 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 the, the Merton uh, argument that dynamic hedging and loaded dynamic hedging, the option becomes a redundant security because it can be constructed dynamically, and we assert that that cannot be. And and and, and there's some other uh, things. But tomorrow, maybe it's give me the idea to change my talk for tomorrow. <laughs> so that's why you didn't get your PDFs in on time. Now I know. Anyway, I hate to hold people from lunch, and we're five minutes over, so I apologize for that. Uh, I see Tom has a question. Maybe I can answer it outside with you. Uh, and uh, and great, thank you for coming. We're going to join uh, again at uh, one o'clock.